This is the original eSport racing game. This is iRacing. From the Suzuka International Racing Course, this is the Global Sim Racing Channel's Round 9 coverage of the MX-5 World Tour Season 17 Championship. When it comes to Suzuka in regards to the MWT, only champions win here. In the previous 16 seasons, the tour schedule makers have visited the Origami Pretzels Grand Prix configuration six times. Season 9 saw Frenchman Evan Maillard be first to the checkered flag. The Roland Estonian Errol Numb won here in seasons 13 and 15. And Sonny Catch Me If You Canchin took the winner's hardware back to Australia in seasons 10, 12, and 16. Maillard, Numb, and Catchin, MWT champions all. Well, Kanchen, the only driver in the today's field with champion blood in his veins, well, his destiny does not bode well for the usurpers of the crown. Will the tradition continue, or will somebody break the chain, or perhaps destine themselves as a future MWT champion? For the answers, stay tuned, because all the simulated Mazda action from Green Flag to Victory Donuts can be seen live as it happens right here on the Global Sim Racing Channel via the iRacing Esports Network. Konnichiwa everyone and welcome to Sim Sports News Countdown to Green. Over the next 15 minutes, GSRC will bring you all the storylines, all the stats and facts you'll need to appreciate this 7th edition of an official MWT event from Suzuka. Stefan Slocker joins yours truly, Bill Soupson, way up in the press box to bring you our word's eye view. The hardest working man in Sim Race Broadcasting, Joe Peak has director duties with cameras provided by Dougie Beard. Stefan, the MWT has come here six times before, and GSRC has been here countless times. But for those viewers new to GSRC and IESN, talk a bit about Suzuka. Where to start is the real question here, Sue. I guess a good start is the beginning, the very beginning. I'm talking the late 50s, where the first plans were laid out. Because back then this 3.6 mile long track once should have wound three times over itself in the region where today's S is stand. I'm kinda glad that after a flight over the rice fields area they decided against that plan. Because this layout that lays before us is probably one of the most fun ever produced. 17 turns in total and two of the most famous turns in motorsport. Obviously I'm talking about Spoon and the famous, infamous 130 hour. But to better show you about what I'm talking about, we're gonna send you trackside with the GSRC Lap Guide. All right, we've got Amjad Yaman of the GSRC MX-5, so let's do a lap around Suzuka. The front stretch is gonna be a long blast in this car, so the draft may create passing opportunities, but the braking into one and two will definitely discourage guys trying to enter side by side. You might see a game of chicken into these corners a few times during the race. There's a lot of banking here in turn two, so you'll really want to use it to carry your speed out towards the S's. But from here on out, your line is going to be critical. Each corner flows into the next, so getting offline will screw up your rhythm and be extra costly to your lap time. It should be single file through here after the first lap. Now, coming out of this last right-hander, you want to hug the right to get a nice launch into the Dunlop curve. If you hit it right, you'll be flat out all the way to Degner 1. Get it wrong, and you'll either have to lift or risk drifting into the dirt on the outside. Now, the Degner Corners will be another place where I would not advise trying to enter side by side. It's just a little bit of braking, glance off the curb, and get it straightened for Degner 2. Once again, you've got a heavily cambered corner, so you can take more speed than you'd expect through here. From there, you've got a short time to relax before we hit the hairpin. 
This little right hand kink before it can make the breaking tricky and setting up a pass even trickier. But it's definitely one of the better passing spots on this very technical circuit. However, the most important part here is setting up your exit because the blast around the long gentle turn 12 will be full power the whole way. This is another spot where the draft may offer you an opportunity to close up and get a nose in on your competitor, especially if you're trailing them closely. It's also a bit safer to have a go since there's plenty of runoff around the outside of Spoon. This corner is another one that requires accuracy because it's really a double apexer. If you drift wide after the first part, say goodbye to your hopes of hitting the second apex. And just to add insult to injury, if you did miss it, you've got the backstretch to worry about. Without a good exit, the combination of the draft and the long run means the car behind you is probably going to be looking up the inside. If this happens, hope you've got some large stones because now we're heading towards 130R. It's just the lightest of braking, hit your marks, and get back on the power through this fearsomely fast bend. But before you know it, you're now setting up for the Casio Triangle. Here is your last good place to try to overtake. It's probably the heaviest braking zone, but with the chicane there can still be some difficulties getting the job done, especially if the other guy is a good defender. Still, the exit's going to be important once again because now we're dumped back on the pit straight, and you'll want every ounce of oomph the little Mazda engine can give you. As you come across the line, you finished a lap around Suzuka. And that was Joe Peak perfectly showing how you, yes you, can also drive a lap around Suzuka without failing or going off track. But now, before we get you to the points, remember, remember that the Countdown to Green is sponsored by SimSport News. SimSport News is one of the leading sim racing news website that covers all broadcasted series on iRacing and is run by Jacob Tofts and Louis Emerton. Not just reporting, they also race, as SimSport News Racing competes in many official top-level iRacing series. For more info, visit simsportnews.com. And now, for those points, Soup is going to run you through the pro standings. And these are sponsored by the good folks at Heusingveld. All right, Sunny Kanchen has three wins this season, but so does Yalme Torres. Torres has raced in every event. Kanchen has already burned up most of his no-show compensation, so that 110-point lead is still very much in jeopardy. Coming off his best result of the season, a third, is Jean-French Pinot. Nini climbs up a couple of spots into a podium position. Steven Van Ostrel and Nicholas Berger each fall a spot as they sit fourth and fifth, respectively. But this is the pro standings. We also have another championship race. Uh, Stefan will talk about that right now. <laughs> yeah, Johan isn't here. Uh, <laughs> those AMS championship is, as always, sponsored by SimSport News. And in that AMS championship, we still have Bjorn de Fort from Belgium there. And first, 514 points to his name. But once again, he has a no-show to his name. Derek Holland, eight points behind. Also not here today. First guy to be here today is Jean-Marie Fugu, 77 points. Last round, he gained two positions in that standing. Michael Wardman out of Ohio and Stefan Wehnhoff, they both aren't here either. So that M championship really can get mixed up in those last few rounds. We still have to go. And Soup, I really have to say, in case you haven't realized it, but in that track guide, that was Amchet driving. And I hope you got your wishes out because, as we know, if you see Unicorn, you have three free wishes. <laughs> there you go. We talked about how long GSRC has been part of uh, the MWT. Of course, the very first broadcast, GSRC broadcast, was an MWT event. And that event was actually won by Amjad Yaman, who now does a lot of directing here on the, uh, on the Global Sim Racing channel. Relatively small field by MWT standards. We only have 10 drivers here today. We talked about Derek Holland. He has raced in every race so far. He is not here today, unfortunately. You know, the best of the best in the iRacing World Championships, as well as many private leagues like the one you're watching right now, are showcased right here on the iRacing Esports Network. If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you subscribe. I'll tell you this, GSRC is proud to be part of the IESN stable of broadcasters. And IESN is always picking up new viewers. So with those in mind, here's Steph again to talk about the event details. Yeah, and we're here round 9 of 11. So only th with this one, three more races to go in this championship. So 
It's gonna come very close to the decider today, though we have 18 laps in store for you here around the beautiful origami pretzel, as already mentioned. Uh, setups for this series, just like in the advanced MX-5 Cup, they're completely open, but they have to do one stop, unlike in the AMC Incident Cup. There isn't one, but they get a mouse per incident bonus at the end of each race. All right, all the business is out of the way. Well, one last little piece of business always affects the racing. Let's take a quick look at the weather here in the land of the rising sun. What do you think, Steph? Uh, it, it's for sure going to be interesting. We have on the track 89 Fahrenheit, uh, so a bit lower than what we see in the fall weather. It's also mostly cloudy, so we will see every now and then a cloud go over the track. Wind might be interesting here today. 11 miles per hour from the south to southeast. Also, the miles per hour go between 9 to 15 miles per hour. Um, so it is going to be interesting, but that track of temperature, we're going to have to keep that in mind because these guys will use up their tires on a track like this. All right, now all the business is out of the way. We can turn our attention to the business on the track. Multi-time champion Sonny Kanchen is the fastest in qualifying, put in a 224.1. About three tenths slower is his Asbury Motorsports teammate, the Italian Marcello Pajan. There's Marcello. Yeah. And Marcelo, Marcelo just put up, I think he just... No, that was Mumolides who jumped up there. There we can see him. He just jumped up to third there, so good second lap by him. Uh, was actually about a second faster than his first one, so good job on improving there. Three of these drivers here, three of the very top drivers, were in last Ooh. night's kind of uh, debut race. Go ahead, Seth. Oh, Kamen Amasis Torres there with a nice drift through the 130R. Wheeling that car around there, but keeping the slide on didn't even lift, but probably did cost him a good two tenth there. Uh, let's see if he can improve from fifth position, and yes, he does. Three tenth, he goes up to fourth. I won't give anything away, but of course, the MWT mirrors the advanced Mazda Cup schedule. The only difference is they did a 25 minute race. This race is 45 minutes. You want to check out the advanced Mazda Cup results from last night? You can. Many of the drivers here today were in that one, including the top names of Sonny Kanchen, Jonas Mubilidis, and Steven Van Ofstrom. I yeah, I did any of the results. Watch... Yeah, be careful now. I, I, yeah, I did watch that race just before we went on the broadcast here, and I have to say they delivered a really great race. That was some action-packed race, so I have high hopes for this race today. I do as well, especially with some of the very fastest names up here. Remember, Torres, very competitive. He has three wins already this season. Don't think anyone's going to be able to drive away from anybody. Might be a case of just not using up your tires early on when it doesn't matter. Save a little bit when it's time to go racing for real. We look at the Italian driver, Marcello Pajan, who sits in second right now. Honestly, what do you think, Steph? I think maybe if you can get all the way back to six, we think that Jean-Fran Pinot will probably be able to hang on to the leaders. It might be a tall order for Jordi Fike, Michael Wartman. Uh, Jean-Marie Fergou or Joe McDonald to stay in the lead train. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting at this point the first four to stay in a the train, then the next three, and then the last three. Um, so we have a little bit of a like three-pack racing, kind of like you see in NASCAR. But it's really about getting those S's right, those first tricky few parts of this track to then be able to stay with everyone on the long streets. Qualifying is done with only 10 drivers on the grid. Steph, let's take it a row at a time. I'll take the front row. And it is the multi-time champion, Sonny Kanchen, put in a 224 flat. He's about four tenths of a second faster than his team, Mar Marcelo Pajan, who sits outside him in row two. Steph? Jonas Mumoludis puts the 27 in third place. Alongside him, will be the Spaniard of Kame Damasis Horus. Then we get to the row that we hope we'll be able to stay with the front four guys. That's going to have Steven Van Opsel in position number five. John Frank Kino in the sixth spot. Jordi Fike, the sheriff, sits in seventh place watching over the outside lane of Michael Wardman. Jean-Marie Fergou in ninth and rounding out the field. Joe McDonald, his qualifying time at 228 flat. That's compared to 224 flat from Canton. 
Let's see if those guys, how well those guys in the back row can stay close to the leader. So it should be a fun race. Small field. We'll be able to give a lot of attention to all the drivers here today. You're watching the Global Sim Racing Channel on the IESN broadcast. This is the seventh running here of the MWT at Suzuka. Only champions win. And if that keeps the case, well, Sonny Kenshin probably destined to get the win here today. But you never know. You could win, and that means that you'll probably be a champion in future seasons. We wait for Sonny to get to the grid, and Kanchen is there. All 10 drivers now underneath the Japanese sky pushing down on the track. You can hear the engine start to rev. You know what to do. Gather up the chickens, take cover behind the cows. The horses are out of the barn. Sonny Kenshin leads nine other drivers down into the first corner. Bajan behind him, a little bit of move on the inside from Yaume Torres. Careful, we don't need to be too tough too early. We want to keep those big names around for a long time. Torres slots into fourth position behind Mumulutis. Ben Optro in fifth. And Mumulitas had a big slide through turn one, was able to keep it together. But that yellow car of Shamas' Torres, though, he looks feisty for that P3. Two yellow cars out there. The one that is highlighted in black, that belongs to Mumulitis. Behind him is Torres in fourth. Van Ostrel in fifth. We haven't talked about the back half of the field. Pino, Fike, they're doing a good job staying with the guys up front. Michael Warpman, the impressive rookie back there in eighth position. The gold veteran, Joe McDonald in ninth. He's ahead of Fergu. They go beneath the overpass, heading down to the hairpin for the very first time. This is a passing zone for a lot of classes of car. Really a pointless pass here in this MX-5 because if you just stick on the trunk of the car in front of you, you can slingshot them as you head down in the spoon. And that's what everybody stays in line right now. A nice, clean first lap. And there's sorry, is starting to be a little bit of a gap between uh, Kalmanazis Torres and Stephen von Opstal. It's about a half a second right now. But that's already quite enough to have a little bit of a gap also in your mind where the Stephen von Opstal has to chase that gap down. Otherwise, he's going to lose that find for P4. Likewise for Jordi Fike, the Sheriff, a little giddy up in his uh, pace right now as he sits in seventh, beginning to lose touch with Pinot in front of him. Now they get in the toe and you can see Van Opstal start to pull back up behind those two yellow cars of Mumilides and Torres. Down into the Castillo Triangle for the first time. Here comes an attack from Torres on the inside oh! of Mumilides. They get together again. Mumilides probably cut the corner. He's now loose. He spins and he gets pushed out of the way. The Greek streak is not going to be happy about that. He's back out there. That was a little bit too aggressive from Shamanis' Torres there. Over the curb he goes, two wheels way up in the air. And no point of steering there because that's only going to make it worse. He shoulder checks Mumolides out of the way. Steve von Opstel has no uh, way to avoid that. Also runs into the back, so three cars in one turn with quite some damage to the cars. We'll take a look at this one on replay. I understand when the opportunity is there, you, you'd like to take it, but my goodness, we got 17 more laps of racing to go, and maybe that's not the easiest spot to make a pass. I don't know, the, the, soup, the, the move was on, most definitely. He just cut it way too hard over that curb. If, if he doesn't take that curb that hard, he's easily going to make that pass stick on Mumulides. He was just, as I said, too aggressive on that curb, and then we all saw the outcome of that. Well, there you go. Now the question is, did Taurus pick up any damage to his car? And will be he? Boy, boy, he runs really wide through through Degner. And there we look at the replay still. And there goes the Greek streak off into the sand. Will Mumalidi, will Taurus be able to run down the two guys up in front? That is Pajan now with about a 1.4 second lead. Well, Torres has quite some damage to his uh, left fender and the front of his car from that second hit of Mumolides. Also, his left door is probably not going to open anytime soon. Um, so, yeah, he has some damage and we know that these cars can be affected by extensive amount of damage, which he most certainly has picked up. And look at Stephen von Opstel being all over the back of the Spaniard. Indeed. Back here comes a pass. 
that officer is going to move. This will be, honestly, as they come up to this left-hander, he'll be on the preferred position, and he gets this pass made as they work through 130R. The gap to the leaders, 1.3 seconds. Van Oxel cannot afford to wait. Let's go back in and check on Mumilidis. He's already picked off for goo, and now he comes up on the back of Joe McDonald. Yeah, and what this really has done is it split the field up in, in a few two-car packs. Now with the pass of Stephen van Opstel on Shamas' Taurus, it's about a th four-car pack for P3 right now. But as Mumolidis goes past uh, Joe McDonald on the inside there, and Marcelo Pagnana, 224.0. Good opportunity for the veteran McDonald just to tuck in behind and let Mumolidis, if he can stay with him, pull him up through the field. Next on the hit list for Mumolidis will be the rookie Michael Wortman. Wortman racing in seventh. Now try as he might, we go back up to third position. We have a nice train going on here. The Belgian driver of Van Ostro doing his very best to stay on the back of Pajon. The bad news for uh, Van Ostro is Pajon and Kanchen are teammates, and there is no way that they're going to do anything to slow each of them down. Those two drivers up front are just looking to put in fast lap times right now. Well... They sure do need to hurry because last lap Sonic Engine was two tenths slower than Stephen van Opstal. So, hey. Stephen van Opstal, if he continues this trend, he's gonna catch those two ahead. Remember, there is a pit stop as well. It's possible that Van Opstal can short fill when they come in to the point of maybe even not taking enough fuel to get to the end without a little bit of a help. But if he can get out close enough to Jean, he can save till the end. Well, it, it, it's it's something that Sonic Kanshin can do at times. We saw that uh, last week in Big C's MX-5 Challenge where he ran out of fuel in the last on the last lap coming into the last few turns. So Sonic Kanshin is not prone to under-calculating his fuel. I like that shot as they come at you. You can see the entire field. Let's check back in on Michael Workman in seventh. The Greek streak has found him. As they head down into the Casio Triangle, I don't think that Mumalidis will probably make the pass here. He'll look to get a good run out of this one. As I say that, Workman goes off, and I'll take it when it's there. So Mumalidis gets one more spot. I think he got a little bit scared there by Mumulidis because he surely looked like he's going to dive it in there. I'm expect I fully expected him to do that. Uh, so I think uh, Wardman just a little bit scared by that and out broke himself there. Well, remember, uh, Wardman had a good view of the incident between Mumulidis and, and Torres earlier, so he probably didn't want that to happen to him. So let's tell Mumulidis now has got 3.3 seconds to get up to the sheriff. Jordy Fike in sixth. And the last lap between Stephen van Opstel and Sonny Kanchen. Sonny Kanchen was faster by three ten. So unless it seems like unless Stephen van Opstel finds something, he won't get up there right now. Now we look at the two leaders. You see those up in the those identif the identically colored cars. That is Kanchen and Pajan. Now, if there is an advantage, you got to figure that Marcello maybe has a little bit of an advantage, burning a little less fuel. They all start with the same amount of fuel. That doesn't mean they burn the same amount of fuel, depending on whether you're doing the work out in front or if you're in the draft. And certainly, Pajan has been behind Kanchen the entire race so far. Shamana Masters Torres with a little bit of a mistake into the hairpin, cuts the grass too much on braking, goes all sideways there. Keeps it together though and stays in front of Jean France Franck Henault. Nearly went a full way there with France 1 instead of Franck. Um, but yeah, uh, there's now also starting because of that, starting to be a little bit of a gap between Torres and Van Opstal, but that probably will close in again once they are in the Cassio Triangle. We ride on board with the Frenchman. Now, right behind Pino, you don't see him right now, but the sheriff has indeed put the spurs to the pony as we pan back. 
There he is. I said he needed to giddy up, but he is there now, just a few car lanes behind. He know. A nice little battle for third. Van Ostrom, Torres, you know, and Fike into the Casio Triangle again. Right, left, right, and back out onto the main straight in front of the cheering fans. Interval from Fike back to Mumilides. Just a tick under four seconds. And let's see with Mumulidis, a 25.5 versus a 24.6 to Chorifike. So it seems like Mumulidis, with all the damage he has, he's not able to stay on pace with the Gaza Hatch. So very unfortunate uh, first collapse for Ionis. Yeah, getting around for Goo, McDonald, and Workman is one thing, but trying to run down a train that's being led by uh, Stephen Van Opser, well, that's a different, that's a different undertaking altogether. Speaking of some of the guys in the back, let's take a look at Joe McDonald. He's in a little bit of a battle here, and I think he's about to be overpassed by Jean-Marie for Goo. These guys battle for ninth spot. You know, every overpass needs an underpass, so let's see if Jean-Marie Fugu does the overtake here under the overpass, or if he sticks it into Spoon. Very aggressive there for McDonald, way more aggressive than Fugu over the first curve of the Dagnar curves. So he Down. got himself a nice gap there. Yep. Down into the hairpin. Donald opens up a bit of a lead. Oh, Pinot under pressure of Fike now. He sure is. I'm not so yeah. much. It's I'm not so much. It's Fike gaining on him. Uh, if uh, Pinot maybe lost touch with Taurus. Yeah, Pinot uh, out of the hairpin. He was four wheels on the grass there. Um, but Fike also had a better exit out of the initial exit out of the hairpin. He was side by side with Pinot out of that hairpin. So maybe something with the draft. He is able to do Taurus ahead. He is pushing Stephen von Opstal, really wanting to get he away sure from is. the two guys ahead, uh, behind, and get to the two guys ahead. But much different. You look, is. yeah, you look at him going right past you right now. That was a a push from Van Opstal. Taurus definitely had the momentum to go around him if he wanted, but he think he wanted to see if they had oh. a chance maybe to get up to the guys in front. Woo. Very wide from Van Opstal. That's about 400 x there for him. It's as wide as he wants. Opening that, up the gap for Taurus. Yeah, that's not the pace they wanted. That they were looking to get to Kanchen and uh, and Pajan. The pass is made now by Taurus. So let's see what he can do. The interval. Boy, they lost about a second. They're now about two and a half back. That mistake. They lost about a second to the two leaders. And that also allowed Pinot back into the mix. Bringing fight with them. Sonny catching out in front, doing all the work, burning the fuel. Probably just going fast enough that he has enough uh, tires left to race when it's for real with his teammate. There will be no team orders there. Those guys will fight hard but clean for the checkered flag. And very interesting. We were talking about the underpass and overpass. Um, Joe McDonald still is ahead of Jean-Marie Fugu, so Fugu not able to get him around Joe McDonald. Um, neither into the hairpin nor around uh, the 130R into the Cassie Triangle. So these two, the two amateurs in this race, uh, not counting Ionis Mimoludis here, obviously, um, they really are putting on quite a good fight there. It's an old request on my part that falls on deaf ears, but I still think if they took the overpass away and turned it into an intersection, it would really spice things up here at Suzuki. That's just me. We look at this battle for ninth spot. McDonald ahead of Fergu. A cloud passes over the sun here in the land of the rising sun as it gets a little cloudy out there. And we, we talked about that the race started at about 74 Fahrenheit. Um, it climbed back up through about 84 Fahrenheit and it's dropping already back down to 82 Fahrenheit. So these guys most definitely probably are feeling that more grip they have right now because of the big, big cloud in the sky. 
Let's turn. Oh, look. So we have a little side by side battle. These are the guys in the back. They're having some fun. There we go. Jean Marie Fugu finally getting past. McDonald fighting back. Not ready to give up the ghost yet. They work through the chicane. Don't be surprised if McDonald doesn't get him into corner number one, but a good exit out of that little chicane by Fergu. And wait a minute. It's the early peel late reveal from Joe McDonald. As he pits from last spot, he'll come in, take fuel with 12 to go. It'd be fun how to see fast. how that plays out and as far as uh, with the Fergu. Joe McDonald scared himself there a little bit. He went into the pit lane with about 40 miles per hour which is about 3 miles per hour faster than pit speed limit and immediately jumped on the brakes to about 25 miles per hour to really make sure he's not getting a black flag for speeding in the pits. Joe has been around for a long, long time as he comes out of the pits right now. Copyright infringement rules keep him from racing his familiar golden arches on that machine. But nevertheless, Joe, good to see you out here racing. Well, as long as he has a farm, it's all right. <laughs> Let's look at the battle for fourth. This has been Obstral with Pinot. I think Pinot might be interested in getting that spot. As they head down into Spoon. The Belgian driver being chased by the French driver. He had a Spanish driver with Jordi Fike sporting the stars and stripes. It is indeed the MX-5 World Tour. Six um, different nations, seven different nations represented in the top seven drivers. Go ahead, sir. I'm, I'm still a little bit surprised that Jordi Fike is able to keep uh, with the guys ahead, the three guys ahead, um, he, he is really doing a great job uh, thus far with keeping um, with the three guys ahead. I mean, he, he loses touch every now and then, but it's only ever so slightly. And um, I think that's mostly due to him just saving fuel and saving his tires. Yeah, I talked to Jordy, and that's kind of his strategy. Hang, hang close. And saving his tires is the big strategy. Now... They have to stop for fuel. They'll be able, because the fuel limit is, is so low here, by the time they fill up the tank to get to the end, they'll be able to take two tires and not cost any time. This is different from what you'll see tomorrow in the Big C's MX-5 Championship. I hope I got that one right. I never quite remember it. Challenge. Challenge. There we go. Where the where the fuel is so so, so short that they won't be able to take tires. Here you can take two. I would imagine you'll probably take left side tires. I don't know. Maybe now, now you got side? me confused because I knew that in Big C's MX-5 Challenge, you can take tires. You can take tires, okay. There and I go. thought it was here that you weren't able to take tires. No, nope. so you can be able to take two. What's interesting I'm, I'm is... <laughs> go ahead. I'm now completely confused. Either way, um, tires always a vital strategy. Um, if you can see the benefit more than you can see the negative side of how much longer you spent in the pit. Oh! oh my, almost in the wall. I think you saw it there. That was Van Opstrel. No, I'm sorry. That was Taurus and he's going to lose the spot to Van Opstrel. Coming out of that second Egner. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a look at it. I don't know if the Spaniard got part of the wall or not. Yeah. Probably the best view in the house is from Stephen van Opstal there. Ah, super close for Shamanas Taurus. There he goes, now into Digner 2, and then look at that view. Almost lost his uh, driver's side rear view mirror, but it's still there. You know what? Um, the, the thing is, he actually had a little bit of a slide. He had to correct that, and because of that, he got that close to the wall. So, very lucky there for Shaman of Stars. Well, it was once two and a half seconds between the guys in third up to the front two. Then it got to three and a half. Now it is four and a half. I think we see a trend beginning. It's not yeah, so much pace, Stefan. It's, it's mistakes that these guys are making. The front two are just smooth as blended whiskey. 
as uh -oh. Shaman of the Stars goes into pit lane. Um, to finish that, I think it's both. Uh, they're not fast enough to keep in the lower part of the uh, draft, but also they make just way too many mistakes to be able to keep with them. And I think that is because they have to push that much to stay with the guys ahead, to stay on the lap times the guys ahead do. As Shaman of the Stars finally comes to a step. Remember, the front two guys were your front row as well, and Kanchin's time in qualifying was a 24 flat compared to Van Ostrel, who was almost six-tenths of a second and more than six-tenths of a second behind him. So, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with pace as well as mistakes. There they are. Those two are racing in Asbury Motorsports formation. And I don't think we really have to mention that pretty much a no-brainer but Joe McDonald now no longer in the lead of the guys that have already pitted as Shaman's Stories comes out way ahead of him. But it will be fun to see if Torres how that fares in relationships of an Austral, Pinot and Fike as he's out there racing by himself now. Maybe he figured he was the fastest of the th of the four of them. I'll go out and race by myself. I'll be faster by myself than I will be alone. A small field like this you can afford to do that because you don't have to worry so much about traffic. And Ionis Mumulutis just nearly did a copy pasta of what uh, Shalmas Torres did a lap ago at the Digners. Also, nearly getting a kiss on the tire barriers that are outside of that um, underpass. Now we're going to take a look at the replay here of this one as he is Mumulutis about five seconds behind Jordy Fight. Whoa! Woo! That did look like deja vu. It it, it did start uh, out of Dignar 1 already, where he was a little bit too aggressive, got all four wheels on the AstroTurf, nearly even went on the grass there, and because of that he got really screwed up on the setup for Dignar 2, which is vital. You do, It doesn't seem like it, but it is quite a vital um, setup, because it is a bit uh, steep there, up the hill to the hairpin. Degner, a very tricky combination there. They call it eight and nine. Used to be one corner. Why is it called Degner, Steph? Well, it, it used to be a continuous radius turn there um, until the very first race of Suzuka here. It was a 50cc race where Erich Degner uh, raced uh, and he was the first to crash on his uh, Suzuki. Uh, because a wind gust did blow off his front wheel and he crashed quite hard there. And because of that, to ever mark this first ever crash at Suzuka, they uh, named the two corners after 19 1983 is when they that got into a two-turn uh, corner there. They renamed it to Digner Corners. Kind of a backhanded honor there. I mean, it's nice to have a corner named after you, but you'd like to have it named for maybe a, a terrific pass that you made or something, not a mistake where you put it in the wall. You would be surprised how many turns in motorsport are named after a crash. My goodness, if they used that rule for me and I racing, every corner would be named <laughs> on. But that's, uh, that's I'm glad they don't. that rule doesn't apply. We look at this three-car battle now. Remember, Van Officer, Pinot, and Fike are racing... Uh, Yaume Torres, who's on the other side of the track. Let me give you an interval of my timing and scoring. We'll do that. I think I could tell you how far it is to Torres. 37 seconds. That's the interval between Van Ostrel and Torres, right? In and out before Yaume would get all the way around. Just to give you an idea where they are location-wise, they're Van Officer, you can see them coming. They're just heading down into a 130R right now. And Taurus is just coming out of the hairpin. Of course, all this going on behind the the two brothers in crime out there, Sonny Kanchin and Marcello Pajan, who are just having it all to themselves. Yeah, and I have to add, if I don't get my numbers wrong, the pit stop delta should be around the 35 seconds. So right now, Shamar's Taurus is good by about a second. 
There is Torres. Three wins under his belt so far this season. He has been very successful. He has raced in every event. Sonny and Ketchum have, has missed two. Go ahead. I have to quickly uh, correct myself because the first name of Digna is Ernst, not Erich. Okay. All right. The Greek streak has come in from sixth position. Along with Wardman. And Shama Sistoris, no surprise, gets past him quite easily. Bergu stays out, so he'll get a few spots. You see Mumaliti starting to roll as well behind them. Going to come out about... Well, I'm going to give you the exact time. 5.6 seconds behind Torres is Mumalidis. Which was about the gap of Mumalidis to the three-car pack ahead of him. So, as said, it is going to get really close between Shalman Amasis Torres and the three guys he was fighting with. Eight laps to go. This is season number 17 of the MX-5 World Tour. Round number nine from Suzuka. We continue to look at this battle oh. between Van Opstro, Pinot, and Fike. Oh my goodness, a little bit of mistake from the French driver there. We ride on board with the Sheriff looking up. Don't be surprised if Jordy Fike isn't first out and when it comes to the pit stops. He's been behind these guys the whole time, although he's had to work hard to stay with them. I guess a saving fuel is anybody. Uh, probably the, he knows, probably going to be the best situation, but options have to work real hard. Okay, here comes the, the brothers have split up. Kane remains on the track. Abel comes in. Marcelo Pajan. Jordy Fike into pit line too. Surprisingly, that, that Kanchin and Pajan would not come in together. Clearly, there are no team orders. Pajan thinks he has saved fuel. He's going to come in, take a real short stop, shorter than his teammate. Interesting Drive. thing will be, obviously, how they come out in relation to exactly this guy. Shaman Amasis Torres, through the Kasi Triangle he goes. The other two are still stationary. We'll be Never able mind. to see him. Pajan's rolling. Bike two now. This will be closer than I thought. By the time well, Pajan gets out, he's into one right now. Ugh. Look at Torres, though. This is going to get side by side into turn one. Shamas is Torres Got has him. the overlap. But this tells us that this is going to get really close into turn one once uh, Van Opstal and Pinot pit. Because we'll have two drivers coming out and we'll have two drivers on the track. So, Torres came in of the earliest of them, of the four, and fight comes in a few laps later. He able to cycle out right about the same place. Pit stop times in the box. Torres of 15-9. Fike, wow, my goodness, a 14-1. Yeah, but Panyana, 13.8, the shortest through the pit line, the shortest on the stop. That's right, because he had been behind his teammate the entire time. So what does Sonny catch me if you can't and do? His four wheels have scared the cockatoos from Kintar East to Newman do for season after season. Does he come in for a pit stop? We'll find out soon as he heads down to 130R. Maybe he thinks this is where pace will, will, will be the factor. His car's a little lighter. Doesn't have as much fuel. Can he go another lap? He might not be able to. He may be forced to come in. We're getting close to where the window is. We'll see through the chicane. I'm expecting him to come in. He's around, and that's why you get paid the big bucks here at GSRC. There is the stop. Let's see the two guys behind. They also come in, so it seems yeah. like that's as far as they can go. At this, this point, save an still. This is interesting. Pajan had to do a little bit of a battle. Actually, it might have worked out for him. I think he got a little bit of a toe on Fergu. He gets that done. Before he gets to 130R, now he is into the chicane right now. Kanchin gets his box right now. 
Here comes his teammate. Out of the triangle. Go ahead. Kanchin still stationary, taking the right side towers. Very interesting. There he goes now, Kanchin off the tracks, off the pit limiter. Where is his teammate? Here he comes. Marcelo Panian is oh, going to easily jump. Going to get him. There he goes. See you later, boy, like you're a skater boy. But the gap is probably not big enough for the Italian to race away. Oh, in behind. It's going to get really close. Shamanas is Torres through the Ooh. outside of turn one. Goes past Pino. Not able to leapfrog Steve von Opstal. So Shamanas is Torres slots it in P4. So like my mom always said, it'll all come out in the wash. Sure enough, no matter when they pit, Van Ostrel, Torres, Pino, and Fike, when it's all said and done, they're right back together battling for third position in that four-car train. All the pit stops are in. We are contractually obligated to do this next segment, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. We're going to turn it over to Stefan here for the Back marker salute. Take us there. Let's do the entire field. Tell you what, Steph. You take the back five. I'll take the front five. Well, our first salute goes out to Joe McDonald. Starting P10, a very steady race from him. He still sits in 10th position. So, Joe, you need to get up there. Otherwise, you're not going to gain, sadly, a position. The position he would gain would be versus Michael Wardman, who is about 20 seconds. Oh, wait, I am forgetting Jean-Marie Fugout. There we go. He is in P9 right now. Uh, so he got leapfrogged quite hard by Wartman then. Yep. Um, because they, remember, they were fighting for that P8. Um, but yeah, as that Jean-Marie Fugout, he is your ninth place driver. He also started, coincidentally, in ninth place. Eighth place, Michael Wartman, who I wanted to put into P9, but he actually is. P8. Uh, coincidentally, he also started in P8. Uh, very interesting back half, even though they were fighting quite a bit already there. Right now, as they come out of the pit cycle, uh, 9 through 8. Next up, Ionis Mumaludis. After a very unfortunate start to his race, he sits in a P7 at this point of time. Uh, right now, about 15 or so seconds behind your leaders. Um, and did he actually get any damage repaired? Let me check that. No, he didn't. Um, so he still races with that damage to his car. Obviously, they don't have a free repair in this series. B6, that is Jory Fike, the sheriff, right now, who sees the three cars ahead of him battle it out for the positions around P3. And Jory Fike, I'm having high hopes for him in the latter stages of this race. And we're going to call it right there. That is Trip and Dree's back marker. Shout out. Now, you get to fight. There is the battle up in front. Van Ostrel now has been passed by not one but two drivers. Pinot got around him. While we're doing our back marker review, Torres got around him as well. So Torres now up to third as they continue to fight. All this going on about 10 seconds behind Sonny Kanchen, who is slowly but surely re reeling in Marcelo Pajan. Five laps to go. I think Ketchin has plenty of time to get back onto the trunk of the Italian driver. Italy, Australia, Spain, France, Belgium, and the USA. And then Greece, your top seven. That's a good question. The question is... Uh, Jonas Mumalidis races out of Germany. He's where he hails right now, but he's originally from Greece. He flies the, the Greek flag, so that's just I just cannot associate Mumalidis with the name Mumalidis with Germany, so I just I gotta do Greece. Oh, that's fun! Whee! I have to say, though, in Germany there's quite a big number of Greeks. There you uh, go. That, that is a thing, though. Um, also in Austria, the same thing. Well, they certainly know how to drift a car. All right, here's those four coming at you right now. This is going to be exciting. Here comes a move. Van Ostrel peeking on the outside. Pinot tries to pin Ooh. him out there. 
Not gonna happen this time. Jordy Fike has been back there the whole time. Jordy, you got anything for these guys? Are you waiting, or is that all you got for us? Well, he is the sheriff. He is keeping an eye on the three guys ahead. <laughs> if they do anything stupid, they go to jail, and he is going to take that position. That's it. He's just watch it. Oh, uh -oh. speaking about mistakes, Taurus. He gets it gathered up, and now that's going to open the door on the inside. That is Pinot. They continue to race now through the snake side by side. Oh, Taurus gets back out in front. This is some fun racing now with four laps to go. We ride on board with Torres looking back and we report that Kanchen actually has made it back up to the front and now he waits behind Pajan. We'll give you a yell if anything happens there. Remember, Torres still in the hunt for the championship. Time is running out on the season as he sits 110 points back with only minimal races to go. Down into the hairpin. Fike continues to watch the battle. Fourth in line. Five and a half seconds up on Jonas Mumalidis. Mumalidis. Race did not go the way he wanted. He had the pace, qualified third to challenge for the lead. Got together with Torres on lap number one through the first chicane. The final corner is the Casio Triangle. And Sonny Kanchen goes back out in front again. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that is a little bit of a team tactics from Panyan to let Kanchen be ahead and get him the four points so he can much easier defend his championship. Take a look at pit stop times between Kanchen and Pajan. They were in the stall for basically identical times, 14-1, 14 flat. Cone in behind, much sorry, the same as well. uh, Pinot just took an attack on Torres through the Kelsey Triangle. It didn't work, and now he's under pressure from Steven van Opstal as they go and, side by side. And Mumalides, as that was happening, spun the car. And he hit the wall. I think we're going to probably be able to take a look at that. We'll stay on this battle, though, in a minute. We'll stay right here where we are, see how this plays out. When it all gets sorted, there we go. Pino in there fighting back now on the outside is Taurus. Watching the whole thing is Van Offstrel. And oh! once again, they get together. That is Pino puts it off in the grass, but he gets it gathered up. No harm, no foul. They continue to race on. Yep, yeah, Pino wanted to close the door on Torres there out of turn two, but Torres too much momentum for Pino, and Pino just not fast enough to close the door. So that all happened because of that. And there we go on the replay of Mumulidis. You can see he nearly got it saved ahead of the wall, but sadly did tap it and spun out back onto the track. There we can see it now much better. Just look at how close he gets to saving that car in front of the wall. And when he brought it out on the track, the car was undrivable. He had to park it out on the track. He has taken a tow. Vulturing positions now will be Michael Workman, John Marie Fergu, and Joe McDonald. It's going to be a 10th place finish. Oh, McDonald yeah, and I just done. realized. Oh. Yeah, McDonald did disconnect, but I can't see what happened to him. Must have happened quite some time ago already. All right. Let's focus our attention back up to third position as they race kind of in triangle, triangle formation there. Down into Spoon, Taurus, Pino, and Van Ostrel, and continuing in last is Fight. Go. I can report that Joe McDonald just did park his car. Uh, no damage visible to him, so I think he just gave up on driving. Well, if he would have known that Mumalidis was going to crash, he might have stayed out there a couple more laps to vulture a few spots there. All right, through the chicane for yet another time. Oh. Three laps to go for the leaders. Here come these. Look at this. Side by side this time. 
Oh, Shaw, why did you not defend the inside there, leaving the door open for Taurus? Taurus says, thank you very much, and goes back through. Here comes the sheriff now. He's got himself a toe. He's got a position. He's going to run out of tarmac. The tracks is not wide enough. He's going to scoot through. Is there's room, Jordan? If you want it between the two drivers, he waits. It's going to be three wide in front of him. The sheriff doesn't want anything of this. He backs out. He can see the writing on the wall. Now he tucks it inside. Meanwhile, Torres is out in front. Tino Abels gathers up, and finally, Jody Fight picks up one position of an optional, and Fight may not be done as he's now right behind Tino. There may not be a lot of cars on the track, but these four drivers are putting on quite a show. Let's hope that all four get to the checkered flag in one piece. Jordi Fike wanted to take the gap there, but Torres did slam the door quite hard to not let him through, to not make that a four wide. And I think that it was a good idea to slam that door because that three wide was quite hectic at the very end. Boy, as much as I've spent time doing IRT work and I appreciate Jordi Fike not making a four wide. The fan in me, the racing fan in me, wanted to see what would happen four wide down into the first corner. Look at them, nose to tail right now. Who can get the best drive off of the hairpin? Well, it isn't Fike because now Van Ostrel has a good run. Let's see if the Belgian driver tries to make the move as they head down into Spoon. He swings to the left. You know, in a parallel universe, that four wide did happen and... Oh! Oh! They touch! Up in front, but they get it gathered up. Still fighting it. I don't know if he's going to save it or not. Oh, no, the driver. It's a tank slapper, but he gets it gathered up. He's going to wow. lose the And he's going to have a slowdown penalty for sure. But that was some serious driving as he got together with Torres. Woo-hoo-hoo. We're going to take a look at that one. Meanwhile, we talked about Jordy Fike waiting in the back. The time to go racing is now. The sheriff has laying down the law as they go through 130-yard side oh. by side. Look at the drive from Torres as he powers through. They head down into the Casio Triangle. Torres screams at Shorty with a loud no and slams the door harder than one could ever do. And that caused the Torres to have a bad exit out of that chicane. And now here comes Van Offshore side by side. The car will not go. Fike taking the defensive line on the inside. I think he's got this safely protected. In fact, Jordy can come on over, get a wide entrance into one to get a good drive off, and he does. Got to be careful not to lose touch with Torres. White flag is out. This is where the action is. Meanwhile, up in front, Kanchin has about a five-car length lead on Pajon. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll see if the Italian driver can run him in. This is where the action is. Yeah, let's Maybe. not... Go ahead. Let's not forget, Jordi Fike and Van Opsal are teammates, so they might work together through those last few turns to get up to Torres and challenge him for that P3. There might still be a chance for Pano to get into the mix as well. He's only 1.2 seconds behind Van Opsal. We've watched the battle for third, keeping an eye on the lead. Better go up there now as close down to a car length as they work through the hairpin. Kanchin in front of Pajan. There's not a lot of time for Pajan to get this done. He now loses some ground as the accordion effect comes into play. They head down into Spoon. This will be a sweeping left-hander. It's kind of a double apex corner. They call it 13. It's really two left-handers. We'll see how it plays out. Pajan right behind Kanchin now. Here they come into the first part of Spoon. Getting an exit out of here will be very important for Pajan. He'll have one more stab at it. He can try to go too wide through 130R or force the issue through the Casio Triangle. He has two car lanes back. The Italian driver chasing his Australian teammate. Now he's one car lane back. He's got the run. Let's see what type of line Kanchin takes. He's going to stay to track left. Pajan's car did not go. It kind of stalls out. They head down into the 130R. Let's see if Pajan has one more dive left in him. He's going to have to take it in deeper than Confucius in a submarine. If he wants to get this pass made, they get into the Casio Triangle. Nothing there. I believe round number nine indeed is going to go to Sonny. Catch me if you can't. And he picks up his fourth win of the season. Let's go back to third. Coming down into the triangle now. This is Torres being challenged by Fike. Fike gets a little bit of a hello from Ben Optral. Ben Optral's now out of the picture. Let's see what Jordy can do. Coming out of here, Jordy puts the right side tires on the grass. That's going to kill his momentum. 
third position to Gunnar Torres. Fike is going to get fourth. A Van Officer will have to settle for fifth, and the man who got pushed out, Pino, will get sixth. Yeah, and Chordy did keep it a little bit too quiet there through the 130. Yeah, he could have easily pushed it there for that because he was way alongside of Shamanas' Torres, but breaks there quite heavily to get in behind Shamanas' Torres, so he slots in P4, which still is a very good finish for him. Our top amateur, Michael Workman, gets seventh place, first in class. John Marie Fergu will get eighth position, second in class. Two drivers will not finish. The Greek streak, Jonas Mumelidis and Joe McDonald in 10th. The racing is over here in the land of the rising sun, but our broadcast is far from done. We're going to take step aside for a quick break, but we'll be back for the Hoisingveld wrap-up where we'll run down the entire finishing order, talk to some of the drivers before we put a lock on the gate. You're watching GSRC on IESN. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Heisenfeld Wrap-Up Show, streaming your way on the Global Sim Racing Channel via the iRacing Esports Network. Heisenfeld Solutions, currently being used by countless professional teams and drivers, is now within budgetary reach, all without having to compromise on realism or engineering value. They offer advanced vehicle software and hardware able to simulate any combination of race car and track. Be a better race car driver and get in touch today at Heisenfeld. Com. And let's go ahead and give you the entire finishing order here of the Hoisingveld MX-5 World Tour finishing order. Sonny Kanchen gets the win ahead of his teammate, Marcelo Pajan. Yaume Torres, try as he might to get up to the front two, could not. He was able to fend off the guys he was fighting with, which included Jordi Fike and Steven Van Offrel. Stefan, who you have in the back half of this Jean Francois Pinot, after his big mistake through this boot, only P6. He could have fought, fought there for the P3, probably even had the best cards apart from Jordi Fike, but with that, he sits only six, two seconds behind Stephen Nobstall. Seventh place, Michael Wolfman, your highest finishing amateur, ahead of Sean Marie Fugu, who also is your last car to finish this race because we have two DNFs in the names of Ionis Mumludis and Cho Mac. Okay, I get the honor of talking with our race winner and points leader as well. It is Sonny Kanchen who picks up his fourth win of the season. Sonny, I, I guess it. I congratulations on the win. Let's talk a uh, pit strategy. Uh, I guess no team orders about when to pit, huh? That's right. I mean, uh, first of all, nice talking to you again. And uh, and uh, here we go. So yeah, the pitch strategy. What happened was, unfortunately, I lost contact with my team on the radio. I thought something went wrong. I can't hear. They can't hear me speak. And then, I mean, uh, both Marcello and Jody, and uh, there was Steven Oss. And, and 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 then I was I was wondering what happened at the end of the race. I realized that was I was on mute all the all along. So I realized I was. I put it on mute. The mic wasn't working. But then again, um, there was no team orders or anything. Just we went with the flow. Uh, Marcello and I were working together. And uh, that uh, definitely helped to get away 
uh, in the beginning from the pack behind us. And uh, after we made a gap, it was all about getting to the pit stop. And then I, I, I pulled the dummy on Marcello. So he was laughing about it at the end of the race. Was there any concern that you were doing all the work and that uh, you would have to put more fuel in the car when it came time to pit? Actually, yes, that was another thing. Other, other part of the story uh, on this race after the pit stops, um, after a while, I couldn't, li- I couldn't, I don't know what, where Marcello just came in front of me and uh, I was looking at my fuel and I realized I was just about um, 0.3 or something short. Actually, I was wanting to save fuel, and luckily, Marcello was uh, ahead of me. And this, so I wanted to just um, settle in his draft and try and save fuel. And that's when I also realized, why are we going so slow together? And that's when I realized Marcello also was <laughs> trying to save fuel. So at the end of the race, we actually, Marcello uh, lost the battle, though. He just um, lost fuel at the Cassier Triangle, um, and then I was at the, just at the finish line, um, just out of fuel. <laughs> That's how close it was. But it's always fun to watch you race. Congratulations on another win. You, you increase your points lead a little bit, closing in on yet another championship. Good job. We'll see you down the road. Thank you, Soup. And uh, shout out to everybody, Joe and Stefan. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers. Sonny Kanchen in a good mood today with a win. All right, Stefan, who you got? Sonny Kanchen, more like Sonny Kanchen today. Um, we got Marcello Pagnan. Uh, your second place finisher losing out to Sonny ever so slightly. Marcelo, talk us through your race because you were up there just not able to do anything in those last dying moments. Well, hi, hi guys. Um, Stefan, thank you. Uh, I wasn't able because, ah, simply, <laughs> I'm a little slower than Sonny. We, we all uh, know about that. Uh, and two, I, I was a little uh, short on fuel. Uh, I guess to to save uh, a point point two two, two liters uh, on the end, so uh, and still got to, to um, run uh, run out of fuel on the Cassius triangle, but uh, uh, yeah, th- there was uh, no way that I could uh, uh, race uh, race on it. Quite interesting how you both run out of fuel, even though you had yeah, they... no pressure. <laughs> Um, but yeah, let's talk about the race. You kept it quiet. You tried, probably, I'm going to guess you tried to save fuel behind Sonny uh, when he also tried to save fuel. Um, how, how 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 did the strategy play? Did it play out in a way you wanted to? Or, or did you think like, ah, I could have done so much more? No, the strategy was to follow. Just follow Sonny and bump draft him uh, if I could. Uh, yeah, I was saving... Uh, fuel because uh, I was uh, lifting uh, on the on the two main main straights, and so I, I was saving 0.3, 0.4 uh, liters, and then uh, I gotta save save uh, that, that that amount uh, on the last uh, three laps. Uh, but uh, no worries because uh, me and Sony were so so up in front, so. Well, it's still a one-two for you guys. Now, I'm going to let you leave on the last thought. How are you looking forward to Daytona, which is next up on the schedule? Oh, uh, I really like those uh, those kind of tracks, Daytona, Watkins Glen, and so on. So, uh, it will be a, a draft war. Uh, we will try to, to, to work together. Again, and um, bring it home. Well, you're going to try to bring it home. We're going to have a close eye on you. Thank you so very much for talking with us here, Marcello. Um, uh, to you, well, it's always a great talk. Bye. Marcello Pajan, your second place finisher today. A couple happy Asbury Motorsports drivers there. Okay, our final interview is going to be with the Greek streak. We talk, he qualified today in where he qualified in 30, had big hopes. Of course, we're talking to Jonas Mumilidis. Jonas, there are so many easy places to make a pass. There are so many laps in the race. Maybe having somebody try to pass you in the chicane at the end of the first lap, maybe not your favorite place to have that done. 
uh, that is absolutely not never taking place at all. I am very disappointed by what uh, uh, Torres did there. Um, I don't want to uh, become too uh, offensive, but uh, that definitely uh, was not proper, and that incident was all on him. Yeah, you got to figure if he just holds his weights and he can get you going into one in the slingshot or, or so many other opportunities. Well, once you had the issue, you did a good job of fighting back. You were able to pick off a few of the slower drivers, but then it got a little bit tougher. You know way to get up to those guys that you were racing with before. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, catching up to a group is different than catching up to an individual. I was the only driver on the track that did a sub-24, a 223, uh, without any draft, except for Sony. Um, so I definitely had the pace, but unfortunately, together as a draft, they were at 24.1. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's like, if I catch up three tenths a lap, uh, after 10 laps, there will be three seconds. It's still not enough to catch up back to the draft. And uh, as you saw, I made some mistakes there. I overcooked uh, twice, I overcooked the corner and lost over two seconds. Um, and uh, yeah, that just killed my motivation. And at the end of the race, it was just forward or not at all. So I just, um, I was driving, I was literally heating up. I was driving with all I had, with all I had in me. I was driving, and uh, then I came up to 130R for the, I don't know what, how many time, I didn't even count at yeah. that point. And uh, yeah, as you saw, I overcooked it and ended up in the wall. It's unfortunate, but uh, yeah, it was no point. One of the advantages of sim racing is you don't have to pay for the repair, so that's something you can do, get your frustrations out. It's always fun to watch a race. Sorry it didn't go your way, but uh, good luck. We hope to see you again. Thank you. All right, the Greek streak, Jonas Mumilidis. And that's going to wrap it up here for the Global Sim Racing Channel and the iRacing Esport Network. We'd like to thank everybody at the Quality Racing Syndicate for organizing this series and contracting with GSRC to broadcast it. Thanks to the sponsors, that would be Sim Sports News and Hoisingbelt. On screen now are just some of the equipment and software used to stream cyberspace into your place. How about additional thanks to June Milan, who provides our wonderful music. See the screen to how to get a hold of more of her great work. The MX-5 World Tour returns in two weeks. That's going to be May 25th for round 10 from Daytona. GSRC via IESN will be there to bring you all the action. We hope that you join us. Sliding across the screen now are just some of the upcoming broadcasts, so check those out and mark them down on your calendar. If you'd like more information about GSRC, visit GlobalSimRacingChannel.com or check us out on social media. we got lots of options for you. How about Twitter at GSR Channel? How about Facebook at Global Sim Racing Channel? Or how about Instagram at GSRC underscore Gram? Also, if you haven't done so yet, become a YouTube subscriber by heading over to our YouTube page and hitting that big red button. Finally, on behalf of the entire crew, that would be Steph and Joe and Dougie. I'd like to thank all of you for watching. As it was indeed, Sonny Catch Me If You can and picks up his fourth win of the season here, round number nine at Suzuka. With that said, we're off to have fun storming the castle. So until next time, race clean, race hard, and we will see you on the track.